Hey, everybody. I'm Jason. I'm an engineer on the Asian platform team here in the Trulia office. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the problems that we try to solve uh, with our analytics pipeline. We process several uh, thousand leads a day, messages that we deliver to agents so that we can connect them with our consumers. And to do that, uh, we need to deliver analytics data over to our uh, business department so that they can make decisions on what products we want to build out next. And we settled on using DynamoDB to store all the data to be the source of truth for all our analytics. And we put it all together with Terraform. So I'm going to go through our process uh, and how we arrived at everything. So uh, DynamoDB, if you don't know, it's a NoSQL database. Uh, and it has uh, this streaming API that you can tell it to stream out whenever it receives uh, an insert, an update, or a removal. You can say either call a webhook or call this Lambda function in Amazon. If you're not familiar with, with uh, Lambda, it's a uh, a way to deploy code without managing servers. Uh, Amazon will instantly bring up a server for you and run the code, and then it'll uh, keep that server up for a, a little bit in case you want to execute that bit of code again, or else it'll take it down uh, after a period of time. Uh, the Lambda function in our use case uh, goes out to an SNS topic in AWS, which goes into a SQS queue, which is dequeued by the process that our analytics team takes it and they go ahead and do uh, their analysis and reporting on it. This is what our leads pipeline looks like. It's a very high level view. Uh, it comes into us as uh, just a JSON packet uh, from the front end and it comes into our HTTP API endpoint. Uh, it gets queued up, goes through several of our leads processors uh, goes through the notification pass, or agents get notified that the lead came in, and then the processor will also write it over to our uh, CRM database. Now, we could give our analytics people direct access to that CRM database, but we were looking for an alternative solution because we didn't want them tied to whatever schema we have in our database. So we wanted to remove uh, our current database implementations from this whole process. So we settled on building a new database in Dynamo because it kind of matched our use case. We just wanted to slam a whole bunch of records in it and not really worry about it. And if we did want indexes on it, we could always add them in later. Uh, and that's, that's the nice thing about Dynamo. It gives you a lot of flexibility later on down the line if you decide to add or change how you use it. So uh, this is the pipeline that we ended up building. You can see here, uh, this is the leads processors from the previous slide. And th this block, our leads processor, would send it over to Dynamo, and then the Dy Dynamo DB would initiate a stream which would go into an SNS topic and then uh, enqueue onto a queue where it gets dequeued by our analytics process. So the nice thing about Dynamo is it's fully managed in AWS. Uh, it gives you the flexibility of NoSQL. You don't have to write, you don't have to know too much about the schema or uh, how tables relate to each other like you would in a relational database. Uh, if you want to add fields to a document, you don't have to incur any downtime uh, as you would if you were writing, if you were altering a table in a MySQL database and needed to add a column. Um, we, like I said, we didn't have any relational needs for this Dynamo database. We were just inserting records and, uh, and sending the data along the pipeline, but we did want to have a source of truth and keep that data retained in our system. So it seemed like a natural fit for us. And we don't have to worry about scaling on our end. Uh, AWS does it for us. You tell it how much IO you need uh, for your write and read operations, and it'll take care of the rest. And if you need to grow it over time, 
you can just tweak a few values and deploy it out again. Uh, some considerations in case you might be uh, want to use something other than Dynamo uh, or that we consider for this project was uh, we already have a managed MySQL server cluster here at Trulia. So we could have used that, but we were really building out in AWS. Uh, something else that we could have used is we could have stored this all in Redis uh, or uh, AWS RDS if we wanted to design another schema uh, relational database-based approach. Uh, so uh, I, I covered some of this, uh, some, some of the nice things about Dynamo. It gives you uh, replication over three availability zones and you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to configure that at all. AWS does it all for you within the region that you deploy your Dynamo DB in. It, uh, it's scalable automatically on the back end and you don't have to really worry about it. Uh, data is backed up automatically to S3 and uh, it's integrated with other services like uh, you can pipe data out through Kinesis or Lambda like I'm gonna show here or have uh, webhooks come in through Dynamo streams into, what, into your own uh, server implementation. And it gives you all the nice security access features that come with all the AWS services through IM. Uh, DynamoDB has a key value data store model. It can store scalar values, multi-value uh, for complex data structures like sets or lists. And uh, it supports embedding documents inside documents, so you can have uh, a, a set which contains a list, which contains a list of sets. It has two notions of indexing, uh, global secondary and local secondary. Lo local secondary you set up at the time that you set up the table. Uh, global secondary indexes can be added later on if you want to, to index another particular field in your DynamoDB table. So going on, we work primarily in PHP. So this is an example of how we would insert a record into Dynamo in our PHP code. We get the lead in our system. We process it through a transformation process, which I'll show you later. Uh, it makes it work well with the infrastructure that we set up using Dynamo and, and how we put it in Dynamo and take it out again. And it's just a simple API call using the AWS SDK for PHP. Uh, you just give it a table name and the actual item itself. DynamoDB will figure out uh, what the key is from that data set. And if you don't have that key, it'll complain uh, for the primary key, I mean. And then we do a little bit of error checking and uh, move on to the next one. To get that uh, data into DynamoDB, you have to uh, transform your data to match AWS's DynamoDB schema. So it has, you actually have to call out what's a string and what's a number and what's, what's a map inside a map with the, the notation shown on the right side of this slide here. So you can see I have a simple data structure with a name and age map in it and that gets transformed into this structure here. So you actually have the name field and then you say that the name field contains a string value of, of the string Sam and then the age field contains a number value of the number 12. And then uh, for our use case, we flatten uh, the data uh, it turns out in Dynamo you can't add indexes into nested structures and when we initially did this, when, when we were initially designing what a lead looks like in our system, it had many levels of deep nesting inside our structure. So we were a little bit worried like, well, what if we need to add an index to this later? How do we deal with that? And the solution that we came up with will just flatten all the data before we insert it into Dynamo and then we can always uh, deflatten it on the other side if we needed to. So 
going back here, you can see we're calling this transform lead statement, which calls a transformer. And this is what that function looks like. So we normalize it, which will do this flattening. And it'll also strip out the null fields because DynamoDB will complain if you try and insert a null record. It'll, uh, and then it'll flatten it. To update an item, it's a little bit more complicated because you actually have to reference the, uh, the value in the record that you want to update. So here's an example of what an update does. We have a, we're, we're tying, now tying our lead to a record in the CRM database and we, so the lead comes in the system, we've created the record in the CRM database and now we need to tell Dynamo, hey, this lead that's in your table needs to be updated to tie it to that database entry. So we actually call out the CRM message ID that it's tied to and then we, we have to say, okay, this, this is the field that we want to update and this is the value and then you give it this update expression to say set this field to this value. So it's just a bunch of aliasing that we do up here and our unique key is the UUID field. So uh, this uh, slide sh is showing how streams work in Dynamo. It's a pub-sub kind of system. It will notify on insert, modify, and update operations. Um, and uh, you, you can tie it into Lambda. And you can also use webhooks, and this is kind of an old diagram demonstrating uh, how webhooks with Dynamo would work. Uh, AWS functions are really cool because you don't have to worry about setting up EC2 instances, making sure that everything's installed on there. You're working with just a, a base AMI with a, a few, uh, few interpreters installed on it. I think it supports Python, Java, C Sharp, and a, a few other things, and uh, JavaScript. Uh, code gets deployed on demand, so uh, you don't have to worry about deployment. And uh, when uh, the Lambda code runs, it'll keep the instance up for a little bit. So if you run multiple uh, queries against your Lambda, it'll keep, keep it up and not shut it down for performance reasons, and you only pay for the time that the code's running. Uh, this is what every Lambda handler would look like in code. Up at the top is a JavaScript example, and the bottom is a Python example. It just takes uh, it, the actual Lambda event, which contains a well-known data structure uh, um, and if, in the case of Dynamo, it, it'll have the record and the operation that's performed on that record, and it'll also give you what's changed in that record if it's an update. And the second parameter is the context, which gives you environment information about the Lambda, which I haven't really found a use for, but I can see how it would be useful for uh, like metrics or monitoring purposes. This is what our... Uh, Python code looks like in our Lambda function. This is the entry point, so it, you can see at the top there, it's taking that event and context parameter and, and setting up our service with it and then returning the result. This is the main processor code, so we're iterating through each of the records that come in through our Dynamo stream. So uh, when Dynamo streams out to Lambda, it could potentially batch records so that's why we need to iterate through each record that comes in. So it, it could come in with 10 updates at a time, for instance, and we would need to process all those updates individually as if it's uh, one record. Uh, so we determine if it's, a, if it's a new record or if it's an update event because we only want to notify for update events. I'm just looking for the update event that's the record with the CRI message ID that's now tied over to the lead. And then at the bottom, it's just your basic uh, SNS publish notification code that you would see in any Python program. 
So we just uh, set the ARN in there that we're publishing to and uh, pass it our message. And also here, if you notice, uh, we're unflattening the lead that came in. So I, I was showing you the, the flattening process earlier so that we could store the flat structure record inside our DynamoDB. We wanted to uh, transfer the, the actual unadulterated record over to our analytics team so that we're both uh, looking at this data through the same pane of, pane of glass. So we uh, wrote a little bit of unflattening code that does the reverse operation of what we did earlier. Uh, failures in Lambda are handled by AWS. The function could potentially time out when it's trying to reach an endpoint, in which case it'll bubble up an exception. Uh, it could uh, fail to parse the input data or, uh, or run, run out of constraints for some reason. Uh, AWS could just decide it doesn't like your function that day. And in our case for DynamoDB streams, it'll actually retry that for you automatically. I haven't tested this, but that's what the AWS documentation tells me that that's what it does. Uh, or if you have a, a synchronous event like tying API gateway over to Lambda, uh, it'll actually emit an error code which will bubble up to the gateway and return to the function. And then you'll have to retry on your end for whatever's hitting that gateway endpoint. Uh, like I was saying earlier, SNS is a pub sub system. SQS is uh, Amazon's queue system. You, uh, for our approach, we uh, would give, we wanted to build a pipeline that was flexible and allowed different uh, analytics uh, people on our analytics staff to set up their own queue. So we fanned out the SNS topic over to different queues. So in case someone else wanted to subscribe to our topic, they could set up another queue easily. And we put it all together with Terraform. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Terraform lets you do infrastructure as code. Um, configuration in Terraform is declarative versus something procedural like Puppet. Uh, it's a complete system defined in configuration, so uh, you you can look at the state of the system anytime and know that that's what you have deployed. And it supports immutable infrastructure, which is which we, we like because you avoid configuration drift over time uh, versus for different uh, things that you might have deployed out and you don't lose track of what's deployed where. And uh, yeah, it, it works on the Google Cloud Engine, uh, AWS, and a few other cloud platforms. Uh, and Terraform is uh, pretty expressive in what you can put into it. It allows you to reference uh, variable or reference uh, configuration statements inside other configuration statements. So it's easy to glue these things together. It allows you to specify inputs and outputs so you can modularize and plug these things together. And um, it, it has a, a few other nice things like, like uh, inter interpolations for referencing these, these configurations. So our basic workflow that we use for Terraform here at Zillow Group is we define all our configurations. Uh, we check, we uh, run a Terraform plan just to see if there's any errors in our own environment. And then we check those configurations into our uh, Bitbucket source repo. And then we have it reviewed by our peers through uh, the social coding part of Bitbucket. We deploy it to a test environment, get it verified by QA, and then finally deploy to production. Uh, so where Terraform can kind of trip you up is if you make changes against your Terraform configuration in AWS, which you probably never want to do, but it could cause conflicts in the Terraform configuration and could cause errors when you deploy it out. Uh, I've 
misconfigured uh, Terraform a few times and just had it hang mysteriously. Uh, fortunately, Terraform has really great logging. Uh, so if, if you come into trouble with it, you can always turn it on and, and dig through the logs and see actually what HTTP events it's issuing over to Amazon or whatever your uh, cloud provider is you're targeting. So this is how we set up our SQSQ. You can see we're defining a resource named SQSQ. Um, we're, we're, we're using Terraform's AWS SQSQ resource, resource to define a queue, and then we're defining all the parameters that, it, that Terraform needs to be passed in. So these are all the inputs that we give in, that are specified in another file. And these are put into a module, and then this module, this code here, would be in the module. And this would automatically set up a dead letter queue so that if a message comes off the queue and it's not handled properly for a while, it's not deleted properly off the queue, it'll eventually, uh, after so many retries, it'll get into a dead letter queue where uh, you'd have to handle the failure. And this is an example of our inputs file to that SQSQ. So now we can simply say, hey, this is our uh, retention period on this queue. Uh, so uh, if a message is on a queue for longer than that, that retention period, it will be deleted. And we can define it differently for our uh, dead letter queue. And um, we, we can also define things like how many retries will it take until it goes from the main queue into the dead letter queue if we wanted to. But this, this is uh, how we set up the queue to begin with, just with the uh, basic parameters. And here's an example of specifying the outputs. We have our, uh, we just want to get our queue URL, the ARN, and, and maybe we uh, would want to include some IAM credentials or something like that so we can plug the things together or later on down the line maybe we want to share those credentials with the third party. So we, we could define the IAM resources created around this queue also as an output. Uh, this is setting up a CloudWatch alarm for that queue. Uh, you can see we can reference the queue name that we created in an earlier Terraform configuration in this uh, block here. And then we wire up SNS over to SQS. And we're using uh, Terraform modules up here, using the module statement. So we actually give it a git URL to get that SQS module. And we're saying, hey, we're going to define uh, an, another block named SNS to SQS, and this is going to use this SQS block message, and then we can pass in. It, I was showing earlier how we have our inputs, like uh, application name and SQS policy. We're actually uh, passing in those variables here. You can see that we set up our policy uh, down here, and then we set up the SQS, we're, we're, we're using the SQS name. in another place. So this is setting up our SNS topic. We, uh, we call it uh, SNS to SQS in the uh, resource name. And then we reference the SNS topic that we created in our input file. So here we're calling our SNS to SQS module, and then we simply define the SNS application name and the SQS application name from those previous Terraform configurations and pass in the retention period. Uh, here's a, how we set up our DynamoDB table in Terraform. We say uh, what IO read capacity, IO write capacity for the operations. Uh, we specify the primary key, what they call the hash key in here, and we tell it what the type is for the hash key. And we also say we want to stream it, and 
these are the records that we want to stream. You can stream uh, just inserts, uh, which would be new images, or inserts and updates, which is new and old images here. And then to tie that Dynamo DB into the Lambda function, we define a AWS Lambda function here and tell it to, uh, on, on the bottom block here, we're telling Dynamo to go ahead and stream events to that Lambda function. And you can see this is in this uh, bit of Terraform here, you can define what interpreter you want and if you want your interpreter or if you want your Lambda function to run code from an S3 bucket, uh, you could also define a uh, zip file that you upload with your Terraform code. So uh, going back to the Lambda script, uh, um, this is the initial entry point for the handler for Terraform script. And here we're passing in the ARN for the SNS queue generated by that Terraform. And if you uh, look at this lambda here, you can see we're actually defining environment variables. So what we did was we told Terraform to create an SNS topic and give me an ARN for that, and then we can pass that ARN as an environment variable into our lambda function, and then our lambda function gets that ARN by reading the environment, and uh, then, it, then it can access whatever Terraform creates. We don't need to know about it ahead of time and, and hard code it, or uh, define it later and put it in something like a key value configuration database. So it just reads this uh, OS uh, function call from Python to get the SNS IRN. It also gets the uh, Dynamo stream event in case we wanted to do updates versus inserts. We gave the option to do that in there. So that uh, Terraform established our full pipeline. It set up the Dynamo DB, the Lambda handler, SNS topic, which feeds the SNS queue, which goes into our analytics process. Uh, so Lambda functions re uh, require code to power them. So when you run your Terraform apply, you can uh, specify a zip file, and then Terraform would read that zip file and upload it and deploy it with the rest of your code automatically, or you can just reference an S3 bucket name and bucket key. So in this case, we chose uh, uh, to use the S3 bucket. But whenever we updated it, ter or the Lambda function needs to know, hey, I have an update here. Uh, and we were trying to figure out, well, how, how would we deploy these updates? Like, let's say I, I wanted to take out the unflattener from my Lambda function because we didn't want that anymore. I wanted to do inserts versus updates for the SNS notifications. So how, how do we deploy those updates? So uh, I found this neat blog post on AWS saying, well, you can just write a Lambda function to deploy your updates. It, it'll listen on a S3 bucket for changes, and then you can have that uh, auto deployer push out and update your Lambda function automatically. So this is the Terraform to set up that auto deployer. And then uh, you end up with this uh, Rube Goldberg kind of contraption. So this is the uh, JavaScript Lambda function, which does the update of the Lambda function. And you can see I'm, I'm just calling the update function code command, which will uh, say, hey, look at the, whenever we get uh, an update on this S3 bucket, go ahead and uh, update that Lambda function with the update function. So, so every time, uh, and S3 gets changed, this function will run. And now our deployment job from our, or our deployment from our Jenkins job is uh, quite simple at this point. All we need to do is do a AWS S3 CP command, and that will push the zip file, which will uh, invoke the Lambda function, which will update the other Lambda function. So is that worth it? I, uh, I don't know, I, I saved a line on my deployment, uh, so, so I don't have to go 
AWS uh, Lambda update function. I, I can just do that all. So it seems like I'm trading all this code to save a line here. So maybe you don't want to do that? I, I don't know. Or if you have like a big DevOps operation, I think this just shows the, the power of Lambda functions that, that you can run a lot of your DevOps and deployment and, and, and CI, CD stuff. Uh, just power it all by Lambda functions as opposed to building out Jenkins jobs. Uh, some other alternative approaches, kind of looking back on this, thinking what we might have done differently or, or better is I, I would have liked to build uh, an SNS2 SNS uh, pipeline instead of SNS2 SQS. Uh, just to give people the flexibility of having their own topics that they can publish and subscribe to, rather than just this rigid, you, you get a queue, and then once you dequeue the message, it's gone. Uh, we've, we've had a few ask for that. Um, and as I mentioned, the auto-deployer might be too complex than needed, but it's still kind of cool. Uh, I'd, I'd like to test the retries in the Lambda function, uh, just to get more of a sense on uh, how the actual behavior par uh, pairs up with what's in the AWS documentation. And I've, we've, we've had the system running in a while, and I've, I've kind of looked at, peeked in at CloudWatch every once in a while, but we don't have any really good monitoring on this as of now. So ultimately, like, what we would do is need to count the number of records that are coming into the system versus the number of records that analytics sees and sees if there's any differential there. Uh, some alternative approaches to what we've been discussed is uh, we could have had our internal data model all flat that would uh, play better with Dynamo. Uh, we're not really working on the petabyte scale, so we don't have to solve the big data problems that uh, some folks have, uh, but if you if we were doing this in big data, we might have considered something like uh, Kinesis and Redshift instead of uh, DynamoDB and SNS. Uh, something like this could easily be implemented in uh, MySQL or a relational database, uh, uh, just, like, just like Dynamo. I think we chose Dynamo partly because we just wanted to play with Dynamo and experiment with it. Um, and of course, you're not tied to Lambda. You, uh, any Lambda function could just as well be implemented in the EC2 instance with uh, auto scaling groups. And that's my talk. Any questions? We're on seven. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why at our company we're finding it difficult to use Lambda is monitoring its failures and uh, its log outputs. Um, how do you... Uh, do you have like a centralized logging thing, or are you like one of the one of the solutions we've come up with is writing a lambda to detect failures of other lambdas, very similar to your deployer? Um, so, uh, yeah, how how are you kind of monitoring that your lambda is correctly working? Because one day it could just stop working, and then the data analytics team might just think leads stopped coming in. Yeah. So since this is an analytics pipeline, it's not super critical, and we haven't done a lot of work. This is just kind of dipping our toes into it. So we haven't been actively monitoring it. We have plans for some of the other Lambda work that's more business critical. We are, uh, we, we have all our logs going to CloudWatch, and we have all the CloudWatch metrics. We've started uh, tying our CloudWatch alarms into PagerDuty so that we get notified for Lambda failures. And then as far as the logging goes, we have uh, nothing set up yet. It's just using the, the CloudWatch streams that you get out of the box with Lambda functions. But uh, some things that we were discussing was uh, just taking those CloudWatch streams, putting them onto an EC2 instance, and then from there you can put it into a logging ag aggregator like an Elk Stack or Splunk. Cost perspective, do you think this is a pretty cost-effective solution to an AWS? 
as far as like, you know, compared to the alternates you described, you think this is pretty cost effective? Yeah, as far as infrastructure goes, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I didn't actually evaluate the costs. And our volume is low when I was looking at it. It, it can't be more than like a pocket change. Yeah. yeah. But as far as like cost and engineering time to set all this up, I, I think it's, it's a good saving for us. Yeah. I haven't touched it uh, since I set it up. So, zero. <laughs> Yes, I, I do have unit tests written for this code. And I was able, it it's, was uh, an interesting learning experience for me because I wrote the Lambda in Python and I'm not a Python programmer. So I had to figure out, oh, how do you unit test in Python and how do you make mocks and stuff like that. And actually it's, it's uh, quite easy to make mocks and write unit tests in Python. So uh, what I did was I used the, uh, uni the unit test package which I think ships by default with Python 3, but uh, AWS Lambda only gives you Python 2.7. So uh, what I did was I just wrote a uh, de developer setup uh, portion of in my make file where it would execute the unit tests and uh, before it deploys out. So we have, we have unit tests and checks before we actually deploy it live. But yeah, uh, so what you would do is just mock out like the, that event and that context uh, entry point for the Lambda and, and go from there. Yes? Yeah, so we would have to model it in uh, SQL or model it in a relational database. And because we have nested structures, it would probably be a, a complex multi-table kind of schema. So it, yeah, so, so the, the flattening to me, just thinking about it would seem a lot simpler than trying to model this in, in a relational schema. Yeah, yeah, and that's another great point is we, be, because we partner with all these other companies, we don't have uh, really good quality control on the data that comes in. So, so, so some days there's an additional record and some days there's a missing record and, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll hand it off to